I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Gubbi Gubbi Undambi people and the traditional country in which this event is taking place and the elders both past and present. I also recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. Welcome everyone to this Morton Bay Region Libraries online event and I'm Helen Cousins, the Local Studies Leader and it's wonderful to have you all with joining us today to hear Greg from the Queensland Rail talk to us about the railway connection to Kukoi. Welcome Greg. <laughs> Thank you very much Helen and hello everybody down there in Brisbane and beyond. Uh, just a little bit of a quick uh, background. Um, I'm talking to you today from Toowoomba from the uh, from the railway cottage up here at, at Toowoomba station that we call the loft. The part I'm in was built in 1908 and the modern part that adjoins me here in the other part was built in 1915. Uh, so it's a 112 year old uh, building I've been operating out of here for the past nine months during the pandemic and things like that. And being a Toowoomba person uh, these days myself, it's been wonderful. Um, when I was talking with Helen about this, we decided to have a bit of fun. And uh, Helen and I, we only met face to face when it was out at the Dabra Railway Centenary Day, wasn't it? When I got drenched by the um, by the marquee that kept dropping water on me from the storm the night before and that and I wanted to take all the water back home here to Toowoomba to water our flowers and that but that failed. But um, I was telling Helen the story is that the cottage that I'm in here apparently has a ghost. Now I have been here on weekends and in the evening and things like that for various works over time and I must admit I haven't encountered a ghost yet. So that's why we settled on Friday the 13th at 1300 hours anyway. So uh, to try and keep the elements there and Helen, sorry, it hasn't turned up yet anyway, despite my best efforts anyway to, for the Disappointing. interview. Disappointing. So, <laughs> so it's good. But all right, yeah, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm, I'm, when this pandemic began back in, you know, early this year, much earlier this year, well, quite a few of us were well aware of things and everything like that. Um, I must admit that I didn't think hey, to nine months later, I'd be sitting up here broadcasting live from an early 20th century cottage, you know, on uh, 21st century technology and that, which is quite remarkable. And uh, I've been doing quite a number of these things. So I've become quite the fan of Zoom, Skypes and things like that, I must admit. And uh, yeah, it's quite good. And uh, the best part about it, of course, you can all go and enjoy a, um, a morning tea, hopefully afterwards, those of you in the afternoon tea in the library and things like that. And uh, oh, well, that's a great pity anyway, basically anyway, because I just get to have a cup of tea here for myself. So yeah. <laughs> well, to start talking today about the railway to Kilcoy. And uh, it's a, very interesting story, just the story of Kilcoy and the railways um, that were built in the early part of the 20th century. So many of the railway lines that were built in Queensland were built solely at the uh, basically to develop the land, to open the land, to provide settlement and those sorts of things for people. And it was really, really interesting was that uh, Kilcoy was a bit of a late comer in the time. And uh, when it closed actually in 1964, it's, um, it's still, um, you know, well over half a century in that on. There is still so much of that line that's left out there, and uh, I mean, parts of it have been uh, you know, parts of it have been turned into a rail trail, and that out of Caboolture, of course. But um, there's other parts that wherever you go, you still see quite a bit of the evidence of the railway line being there. But uh, I'd like to talk to you today, basically, about how the line came to be, what it was like during those years, and everything like that. And uh, it was very much a, it's. Um, it was one of the wonderful lines that used to dot so much of country Queensland and that, especially down there in the southeast part of the state and everything. Very picturesque lines that used to go out and they're basically done for the benefit of the farmer. And uh, it was actually government policy for many decades, pre-1930 and even into the latter part of the 19th century. And the idea was that no farmer should actually be more than half a day's horse and cart ride away from a railway siding or a station or something like that. So it was really part of getting people onto the land to develop the land and everything like that. And it was very much, well, it was really like an economic engine in a lot of ways to use a very bad pun um, uh, on the occasion. So yeah. So Helen, let's advance to our next slide as we go. Thank you very much. And it goes with it. Oh, very good. Excellent stuff anyway, so thank you for that. So I'm getting Helen just to advance today because I'm a little bit, uh, I think I've got a laptop here that's about the way to go, the way of the dodo in the next couple of days. A new one is on the way apparently, so I thought I'd trust Helen to, Helen, I'll put you as acting engine driver today, I guess up on the foot plate. So I'm quite happy to, for you to continue as we go. So it was actually in 1899 that a group of parliamentarians that included the then treasurer and minister for agriculture, they visited Woodford and the Durandur areas. 
And what it was was basically to talk with the local population and it was entirely about um, to building a railway connection for the North Coastline. Now, these um, delegations had gone on for many decades in the beginnings of the Queensland Railways and in Queensland itself. The way to get a railway in probably from about say the 1880s onwards into about 1930 or thereabouts was very simple. It was basically to agitate, 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 get your local parliamentarian or parliamentarians on side, uh, present petitions to parliament and then basically uh, have deputations come out and visit you. They could have been with, oh, uh, Helen, we've disappeared for a minute anyway by the looks of things. So uh, we'll have to see if we can bring the, can you bring the thing back, Helen? Oh, oh, oh right. let me see. That's good. I'm we seeing myself, which back? is pretty <laughs> Okay, here we are. We're back again. Thank you, Helen. Anyway, right. so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what uh, happened. Sorry, there. Helen. You failed your first bit of the engine driving oh, test. I did. I did. <laughs> so, but uh, I, you know, I didn't realise I was so ugly either. Well, uh, anyway, I'll have to do something about that. So, yeah. but um, yeah, the idea was, you know, they used to agitate very much for, um, uh, you know, to uh, to have their own railway. And there were always cases of uh, deputations coming out, uh, parliamentarians, ministers for transports, people of influence coming actually to tour the area. A lot of times, you know, it was done, you know, it was very much adventures done in horse and buggies and things like that um, to tour the area and basically see what would benefit. Would there be a benefit in the you know, construction and uh, eventual operation of a railway through those areas? Well, the good thing was that Woodford to Kilcoy was described back then as consisting of very good agricultural land and the possibility of more agriculture as well. And it was very much to be seen as developing the land to um, get people onto the land and go from there. Helen, our next slide, please. There you go. Great. Well, there are two suggestions that were considered and with any railway that was built in Queensland, there are a lot of numbers of uh, surveys that were run. Uh, the surveys that were run were quite literally run through the countryside to see which is the um, easiest way to build a railway, direct route, not always direct route because again it depended on the number of people that had to be served along or the number of people that they wanted to uh, actually uh, when it came to um, uh, putting people on the land, possible towns and things like that. There's always a lot of agitation. There was always a lot of politicking that went on with the railway. Um, There's actually one of our commissioners for railways in uh, 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 Charles Evans. He actually memorably said to parliament one time that everybody wills, wants a railway for their own parochial interest and that was very much you know the feeling of the day that um, you know parliamentarians and actually um, people wanted the railway literally you know to develop themselves there's many towns in queensland that uh, came about because of a railway um, places like longreach bar calden emerald in central queensland hewenden richmond and those areas and uh, julia creek in the north there's a lot of places in queensland that disappeared when they didn't get the railway and uh, it was always seen that the railway would basically guarantee economic prosperity for the area and also would basically mean that you know there would be an ongoing uh, well literally the town would survive and it would thrive at the same time so in relation to um, surveys for the railway from Caboolture and initially out to um, Woodford and eventually on to Kilcoy there was two suggestions one was actually via Beerborough and that's probably a, uh, that was actually a far more direct route than one coming out from Caboolture it was actually about 10 miles shorter in the survey, about 20 kilometres shorter. And um, they were actually pushed for that, uh, but the, the two routes were always, you know, there was always comparisons done. They'd be presented to Parliament eventually. Costings would be done on how much it cost and everything like that. Now, there were always a number of petitions that were presented and to the parliamentarians, the call for the rail connection. And generally they were done when the parliamentarians came to visit or something like that. The petitions would be handed over by the local people, the agitators and things like that. Quite often there was like a railway committee or a railway progress committee or someone like that who'd take it on. Now, interestingly enough, in an effort to build more economically, um, a survey was also taken on an option to try and basically lessen the cost of uh, construction of the railway to make it more economical. And one of those suggestions is actually to um, look at um, constructing the railway line on a narrower gauge than the Queensland gauge. And our gauge here in Queensland and looking out the front here from the loft, where I see a ballast train sitting out in Toowoomba Yard at the moment that's just come up off, off the southern line. That gauge is uh, between the rails is three feet six inches, which in the modern currency is 1,067 millimetres. To the early part of the 20th century, there was a lot of um, economies that were being practised. Um, talking about construction of railways, they're actually looking at building in with narrower gauge railways to, again, 
lesson, uh, basically is a lesson in economy and things like that. The thing that would have been interesting, one of the things that they suggested was building on a much narrow gauge, and that was on two feet six inches, which is six, 792 millimetres. And uh, that was to lessen costs in relation to engineering, to embankments, to cuttings and things like that. Now, those of you who are actually familiar with the Puffing Billy Rail and the Dandy Nongs in Victoria, that's a two foot six gauge railway. Um, and had it been built, it's entirely possible that you would have had almost like a little uh, Puffing Billy Railway, you know, running out to uh, Woodford and, you know, then onwards sort of things. Um, there's the uh, Australian Narrow Gauge Railway uh, Museum um, or Society is at Woodford and they've got a, uh, they've built a, a small museum there for two foot gauge, which is the sugar gauge, uh, sugar tra tramway gauge and that. So you've got a little bit there. They also suggested you're building that gauge railway out here at uh, from Dolby up to um, Bell and up towards the Bunya Mountains. So the idea was not done in isolation, but it was seen as a, you know, as a possibility. And uh, there was one that was actually built, Butterham, and that was Butterham to Palmwoods on, on the um, Marichi Shire, I think it was. They built themselves a line there anyway, and that's what they did. So that's a two foot six gauge. And that photograph there, that's Caboolture, taken around 1910. Uh, with the uh, Bullock teams there and the yard very full of timber and stuff like that. And that's taken uh, about fairly, about 1910. That was just before they started a lot of heavy works on the um, North Coast line. A lot of relaying in that um, at stage. There was a huge amount of money injected into Queensland, especially into the construction of the Queensland Railways to um, basically, um, it was probably the largest and only ever grand railway plan that was ever presented to Queensland. Next one, please, Helen. Great. So I mentioned before about uh, that uh, narrower gauge than normal, the um, two foot six gauge. Um, again, as I mentioned about locomotives, that's um, a Baldwin locomotive, two foot six gauge for those who are interested. Yes, that's a puffing belly locomotive. Um, yeah, I must admit, uh, part of me does like, think the idea wouldn't have been great. You know, you could have a puffing belly run running from Caboolture out, but anyway, they never eventuated or anything like that. There was one slight problem. The Queensland gauge is three foot six, as we said before. This gauge is going to be two foot six. The, the locomotives and carrying rolling stock cannot go from one gauge to the other or anything like that. So if you're running your own locomotives, they might have to have their own servicing points or workshops or anything like that. And uh, basically the costs of trying to reduce gauge there was sort of like the infrastructure as they call it now and everything that went with it, that would add more money to it. So I've actually paid four cents just can uh, construct with the Queensland gauge, which was three foot six, 1,067 millimetres. And so that was approved anyway. And uh, I actually mentioned before that there's a large amount of railway construction that was going in that period from about um, um, beginning the late part of the early part of the 20th century, around about 1907, 1908, really picked up in 1910 and those years onwards. And um, there was also talk even that about not only constructing a railway out to Woodford and beyond, they were talking about continuing a railway through from Caboolture to, through to Nanango as well. Um, the Nango, of course, had a railway that came, opened about 1911 and it came down actually through Kingaroy in those areas. It came down through uh, and also one to Tarong. So you had Narong, uh, Tarong, you had the Nango. That one goes up through Kingaroy, can't just go back through uh, Mergen, uh, back to Wandai and eventually back to Thebine on the north coastline coming around from Gympie. So the idea was that, you know, it could be a railway that could go, you know, it's a bit of an inland way, could link up with other mines and things like that. But ultimately, um, uh, it was decided that the railway, you know, actually made you know, sense economically. It did go through the parliamentary approval process. Um, the line was approved by parliament. Uh, and tenders were ultimately called for it. And they started work like, um, they started work in uh, April of 1908 to construct that railway line through from uh, Caboolture through to Woodford anyhow. And that's when it began. Okay, next one please, Helen. Okay, now there's a lovely question there about my taking years to approve railways and things like that. I say look to your own backyard. The first railway that was um, uh, mooted for Redcliffe was in the 1880s. The railway line opened to Redcliffe in 2016. So as I said, it does. It did take a while, you know, to get a railways. Um, and there are other parts of uh, Queensland. I think it was, if memory serves me correct, uh, where was the other one that waited about 30 or 40 years to get its own railway as well? Uh, it will come to me shortly as well. Other railways got the, got there as so much more quick. It depended on the political pressure that was there as well anyway. 
So the railway line that opened to Woodford there was uh, just on 20, just under shade under 29 kilometres in length. In the old currency, that was 17 miles and 64 chains as it was. And uh, it actually opened in uh, 6th of December of 1909. So it only took about um, 18 months to construct that initial section. Um, in common with many of these railways that was opened, um, it took, uh, well, it was very much an incomplete railway that was open. Lots of people always say to me, oh, this was the opening date and the first train arrived in town, or this is the opening date that the first train arrived on such and such a date. And I said, Nia, don't get worried about that. An official opening date for a railway is a bureaucratic exercise because basically it means that's the day that um, the line's taken over, the line's approved, and it's actually uh, a lot of times that the timetable's implemented. It becomes really like a departmental concern. In the construction period before that, um, one case is Yarraman. There's some wonderful photographs of the first train into Yarraman. The station's there, the yard's half completed. There's lines leading off that uh, haven't been built or anything like that. But uh, there's a, trains are coming in. It's a construction train. So whichever way you look, first train, opening train, there was, there's always a little bit of uh, rubberiness and stuff, that sort of thing as well. But an official opening was an official opening. And that was um, on the 6th of December 1909 through to, um, through to um, Woodford. It was incomplete. Uh, there were no signals on the line. Um, they, they'd had um, washaways on embankments on the line as well. And they're actually working, uh, still doing track work and things like that for the opening of the line. But um, it was very much a case, get the line open, get it, get it open quickly, get traffic running on it. And that was the idea. And that's actually a lovely uh, postcard that we see there taken there at Woodford. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lovely photograph there. And the colour of uh, Woodford Station, that's right. The early part of the 20th century, they used to um, paint uh, station buildings with chocolate colour, or they used to oil the uh, timber and things like that. So they were a dark colour back then as well. Next one, please, Helen. Great. So the papers of the day, as I mentioned, you know, they were always very, um, they were, uh, there's a lot of agitation that went on. The papers, um, if you go to Trove and you want to have a wonderful um, afternoon, it's always great to read the letters to the editor um, from the railway leagues and everything like that. Copious amounts of columns and inches of print space was taken to taken into Parliament, taken into papers. The advantages of building a railway, who would be advantaged by them the most and uh, the need for it. And a railway at that period was very much seen as a um, Oh, it was it was really literally a link to the world for so many communities. The road system tended to be pretty dreadful in those days, and uh, you know, just regular occurrences of um, uh, drays, wagons, bullock teams getting bogged in soil and things like that it was a regular occurrence. Wet weather and that. The benefit of the railway was it was a permanent way, as they called it, and you could run the train. It would run to a timetable. You could fairly reliant on when you could get your goods to market, when you could get your produce out and things like that as well. And that's what the line was built for. It was primarily built for the benefit, as I always say, not necessarily of our passengers. It was built as much for potatoes as it was built for timber. It was built basically for the development of the, um, you know, the development of farming communities and that. So many times you still always see these like railways wanted to uh, kill koi. Many questions at the present time is the is the line going to be extended from Woodford? The present line is of some benefit. Nothing will satisfy nothing will satisfy the residents higher up. That being uh, kill koi, except a railway that goes right up to their township. So the members of the Kilcoy Railway League, who are the local trading group wanting the extension of the railway from Woodford through to Kilcoy. Um, they actually go, as I said in the papers, they came out replete with good uh, arguments for the extension. Why do we need the railway? Why do we want that railway? And basically, uh, they fought very hard to secure its construction to make sure the government of the day would undertake it. Next one, please, Helen. So as I mentioned before, there are rival routes. There's always rival routes. You have a look at the surveys. They got, they run, many lines have many different surveys run out to them. Um, one line, um, I noticed there before a comment about the Gold Coast. There are many different ones that run uh, over time down to places like Tweed Heads and everything like that. And uh, surveys that were run were always done basically paid for. Surveys that go out, then report back to Parliament, which is the best way to go. Again, you know, which is the easiest route or which is the one of the most benefit. And surveys would actually present a report to Parliament, which would then be laid before a committee, you know, for discussion about, you know, for the railway approval process and that. And uh, the papers of the day, as you say, like the Queenslander, I said, 
only one idea when speaking of the railway, and that's the extension from Woodford to Kilcoy. So with Kilcoy in the region was pushing very hard to get their railway. Um, at Woodford, on the other hand, there's a feeling of content that they have got their line and have no desire to have extended further is very apparent. That was the other thing. If you got your railway, it was a great economic benefit to you and your town. You didn't want it extended because that meant basically a lot of the, um, uh, the economic activity go with it. Because the railhead used to bring in all the teams and bring in all the produce and that would be transferred by to train. And of course, the last thing, if you're a town, you don't want others basically getting the benefit further up a potential railway line of all that economic activity and benefit. Um, one of the classic places in central Queensland is Bogan Tungan. And Bogan Tungan, which is at the base of the Drummond Range on the central line, um, it fought strenuously for many, many years, for a long time, to retain the railhead, even though the line was going to be built over the Drummond Range and over to places like Alpha, Dita, and eventually over to um, Bark Holden and Emerald, uh, Bark Holden and those areas. And uh, they did not want to get it because they knew basically once things started trans shipping further up the line, things would drop off in your town. One other thing of interest is that when the railway lines were constructed, not so much here with Kilcoy, in places like in central Queensland, there were temporary townships that went with the railway line. And uh, it was here on the western line out to uh, places like out to Mitchell and those areas. Um, as the railhead advanced in different contracts and the construction camps went with it, and townships in many cases used to sort of like leapfrog ahead. It wasn't so much the uh, the, uh, the lines in the southeast, um, but as I said, a lot of the other lines in Queensland, there was always a, a railway. It was basically construction went forward. The good news here was there's nothing like in the United States, nothing like hell on wheels or anything like that. Um, there was a much more uh, civilised uh, form of railway construction that went on here. And I think that's one thing we can always think, the fact that we followed uh, British patterns on that, because the American system tend to be, yes, as I said, shoot them dead and build a railroad. Ours tend to be much more a railway, which I always said, a railroad leads you open to all sorts of uh, interesting contentious exercises. A railway is something that was much more enshrined by law and actually was constructed by the government itself. Um, uh, hands length in some cases, but constructed by the railway as well. And the other thing too is um, there was always talk, well, you know, if the railway line's going to be extended, what other areas could it go to? You know, where would the benefit come? Um, some suggest going up through the Conondale Ranges. Um, there's even one suggestion to actually follow the Mary River Valley up then to Gympie, and provide an inland line to its way. And uh, there was always a hard fight there, as you can see, about the rival routes for the uh, various railways that will be built. Next one, please, Helen. That's good. Said public meeting, public meeting, public meeting. They gathered so much um, print space and everything like this. And as I said, it was always the theme of the construction. How long would it take? Um, who would who would be the great benefits and everything like that? And uh, they actually, as you can see there, um, there was always urging of the government, uh, basically build the railway, build the railway, build the railway, make a decision, please. And as I said, it always just filled up so much print space and took up so much correspondence and everything like that as well. Next one, please, Helen. Okay, well, speaking of world records for track laying and things like that, um, it was actually uh, the railway line finally opened through from Woodf Woodford to Kilcoy after approval and actually go from there in 1913, just uh, before the great outbreak of the Great War, of course. Now, constru construction actually began uh, two years um, earlier in 1911. The first sod was turned in a special ceremony to inaugurate, inaugurate the railway works. And uh, progress was actually fairly slow because they only had a small number of men employed. The Kilcoy Railway wasn't built in isolation in that period. Uh, there are a lot of other lines that have been built in Queensland at that stage. There are lines that we have been constructed um, out to, I mentioned to Nanango and places like that. There were places out here on the Darling Downs that were being, lines were being built out to uh, various um, uh, settlements. Uh, there was lines in far north in Queensland. And also in 1910, the um, government of the day under William Kidston, uh, they actually passed, you know, which two great big pieces of railway legislation. One was for the North Coast Line, and it would eventually mean that a railway line would run up the East Coast to Queensland, connect the entire patchwork of railways up the East Coast. So that'd be from Cairns, uh, Cairns down to eventually Townsville, down to the Mackay Railway, uh, heading down further and get down to uh, Bowen, well, to places like Bowen, eventually get down to Rockhampton and that. And there was going to be this thousand mile long railway in the old currency eventually reaching uh, up to Cairns. The same time they're building out on these um, uh, isolated railways, so the railway lines have been out to uh, Ravenshoe and to Moulin up in the um, tablelands behind Cairns and that. 
Um, I mentioned before there's lines going being built out here on the Darling Downs out to places like Hay Hayden and things like that as well. Uh, lines going out to Cecil Plains and all that. So there's an enormous amount of railway construction going on. There are literally at that stage hundreds of miles of railway line being built through Queensland. The trouble was there was a labour shortage and they're actually actively recruiting over in Britain to uh, encourage um, uh, people, labour, well, actually to encourage young men to come out, emigrate to Queensland. In a lot of cases they pay for them if, if um, they were willing to come out and be shipped out here to help uh, build these railway lines as navvies, as construction fellas. But I think it would have been a bit of a shock for you uh, if you um, left England, say about 1910, a bit earlier, 1911, you're coming out on board a ship and then you're offloaded at Pink and Bar. In many cases, you then put on a train and you then travel to some place um, basically you probably never knew existed and even then might not have existed. And you're heading to places like um, on the Mary Valley branch, you're heading out to places like Emmawar, Dagen, Kandanga and these places. You're going out to on um, the Central Burnt. Um, you might be going out to uh, places uh, around Gainda and the other places might Proston and Bailly. So you're basically coming out to build a railway line and uh, as I said, you know, that they, they, they bring, uh, they had to bring in, you know, there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, you know, have been brought in from Britain, basically to go to construct these railway lines. So it's an enormous undertaking that was going on at the time. So construction began the 7th of October of 1911. Uh, it was in the high for that time of great railway uh, construction just before the outbreak of the Great War. It was slow, as I mentioned, because of the number of men who were actively employed. There was also a lot of wet weather around at that time in the early 20th century, especially around that period. And uh, I guess we call them this day and age, I guess, La Nina periods and things like that. And hopefully we'll get more rain this year as well. And that didn't help. But the section was finally opened uh, through to Kilcoy on the 22nd of November of 1913, um, after the extension out from Woodford. So it was just on about, uh, just a shade over 27 kilometres for that extension. Next one, please, Helen. So again, the paper of the day, the Brisbane Courier said the Deputy Commissioner for Railways, Mr. Pagan, I love that name, Mr. Pagan, it was always wonderful. He made an inspection of the Woodford to kill Coy Loy on Wednesday. The earthworks had been a dance for about five miles out of the 17 miles that covered the section. None of the permanent way had been laid down except a few lengths of uh, stacking material. The resident engineer, Mr. Carlton, he was employed by the Queensland Railways. He was collecting sleepers and bridge timbers at the time, but was finding great difficulty was experienced in getting the latter class of timber, which had to be culled about, uh, carted from 12 to 20 miles away from the line. So a lot of timber was needed to build these lines, you think for um, uh, sleepers, of course, for fencing posts, for bridge timbers and things like that. A lot of the state forests that we see still in existence in Queensland, you can in a way think the Queensland Railways for them because that's timber reserves. A lot of cases were resolved for the use of the Queensland Railways for their construction work large amounts of timber that were still locked up in state forests and uh, they need to access all these state forests for the timber to build the line. So as you can imagine, carting it in from about 12 to 20 miles away, you know, uh, for the timber for the sleepers and things like that, it was, pretty, it was an enormous exercise to get all those resources to build a railway line. The irony of, of course, with the construction of the railway line, ultimately a lot of the timber would be cut out, you know, when transported by the railway line itself. And that had opened up the land and eventually for daring and things like that as well. So it was a fairly slow line as they noted at that stage when they were having the construction work in about 1912. And uh, again, small number of men that were employed. Um, railway construction gangs of that period, you know, the uh, fettlers and that as we call them, the navvies, you might have about 150, maybe 200 at a pinch, uh, working on sections with the lines. The other interesting thing is this stage, I know we've got that image probably of the um, hard drinking, you know, navvies as they called them back then, the uh, track layers and things like that. In the United States, of course, you've got the things, you know, they're all uh, basically drinking themselves and sensible in saloons and shooting each other and things like that and uh, doing, doing dreadful things to themselves. That was the Americans, thank you. That's their hell on wheels. In this period, it was distinctly done and it was done by the Queensland Railways. The camps were run by the YMCA, and as you know, the YMCA is teetotal, and it was, and as I said, uh, basically it didn't hold hold with um, alcohol and things like that. Uh, they ran the camps; they actually had employed the cooks and everything like that. So the camps were very well ordered. They had their own cooks and uh, kitchens and involved, but there was no grog there. 
So a lot of the rail, so if they wanted to get drinking and that, they had to go elsewhere. Or sometimes, of course, they tried to make their own um, their own home brand, uh, their own varieties and that. But generally, they were running fairly long on what they called um, ad, ad stemptuous lines. I think it was anyway. So the image of uh, you know the, the, the image of you know the hard drinking uh, uh, track layer from the American West again. That wasn't quite the case at this period, but they were somewhat more civilized then. Uh, next one, please, Helen. Great. So the official opening, well, this was the report that was um, in December 22nd. And uh, with all of these openings, I mean, they're grand events. There was actually um, the, uh, at the time, I think it was Paget. I think it was Paget was the Minister for Railways around that time. And Paget was a reasonably and remarkable fella. I think I've got the comment later on, but Paget was very proud of the fact he said he had opened more railway lines in Queensland than any other previous minister for railways. And by all accounts, he had this enormous uh, collection of trinkets and everything associated with railway construction and railway building. Apparently he had, um, uh, he had uh, little silver sh spades and ceremonial shovels. He had uh, testimonials, apparently had little model engines and carriages and things like that. Had this enormous collection of trinkets and uh, or baubles and things like that. Um, he used to go out to a lot of these things, but um, there was a wonderful comment that was made about him. And I've always remembered this, and I don't know if I quote it later on, but uh, Patchett was described as basically prior to him as Minister for Railways, I said, the opening of a railway to a town was like a great Saturnalia. Um, at work, sometimes they asked me, you know, what's a, what was a Saturnalia? And I said, for those of you familiar basically with uh, Schoolies Week, think of that for the opening of a railway. That's the, the sort of thing. I mean, that was a very large, boisterous celebration that went on. And I described as Saturnalia as, with the advent of Paget, it was something different. And one newspaper of the day said basically <laughs> that he took on turning a joyous occasion and turning it into something like a, for a Sunday school picnic or something like that, or worse. And he'd get up there and say, well, I'm opening this railway, but really the railway perhaps shouldn't have been opened. And uh, they said he was always a great thing of putting a great dampener onto a joyous occasion for the town. But it was always an enormous thing for the railway. Special excursion trains had come out. Um, in, the, in this case, um, there was the governor came out. Um, there was also premiers of Queensland and uh, the, um, a lot of the time, the railway hierarchy. So special excursion trains had come out for um, the opening the line, you know, the ribbon and everything like that. And uh, so they'd come out for the opening and it was always a pretty grand occasion for, the, for them as well. Um, there was also the question of actually dry, um, open the line. One of the favourite things, of course, was putting a ribbon across in front of the locomotive and it actually drive the locomotive through the uh, tape, you know, to, uh, to have the occasion. And there's many occasions that, you know, quite uh, notable locos and that'd be actually up on the engine, given a very quick uh, 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 lesson in how to drive a locomotive, which is, you know, pull a regulator open and things like that. Um, I'm fairly sure the driver there on the day has made sure he had his hand ready to go on the brake handle and everything like that. And um, that's, what, that's how they did it. So the governor actually, in this case, he said um, when he was uh, going to get up on, uh, they actually asked Mr. Padgett to drive the engine through the tape. I always like the fact, you know, the government actually look, is it safe to let him do so basically anyhow? And uh, then they actually took, uh, drove the locomotive through the ribbon and there was always hearty cheers and a lot of champagne toast in that afterwards. So next one, please, Helen. Yeah. Um, now I mentioned uh, the, the governor of the day being Sir William McGregor. I'm terribly sorry, this isn't actually uh, Woodford or anything like that, but that's actually Sir William McGregor when he went to, um, uh, when he actually went out to visit uh, uh, Emerald Railway Station, if memory serves me correct anyway. And uh, that was the turnout, the governor of the day turnout. And then uh, quite often he'd be driven around the town, in this case in the horse and carriage that you see there, and he'd be taken for a canter around the town. The uh, governor uh, had not with the great arrival to show, you know, how well uh, the town was and how spruce it was. And they're always big things, you know, school kids granting them. William McGregor actually is quite interesting. Um, apparently he loved the Queensland Railways. And when he uh, finished up as governor about 1915, he actually is very proud of the fact he said he traveled a lot of Queensland by train. He loved the Queensland Railways. He loved traveling by train. Um, they actually returned it in kind and they named, um, that we had three big gun steam engines of the day, special service out from Brisbane up here to Toowoomba, down to the border at Warwick and down to Wollongarra on the um, mail trains as we call them. Three big engines were built um, in that period, 1914, 1915, and two of them were named. It was a rare occurrence in Queensland to name a locomotive. 
So one was named Sir William McGregor. The other was named Lady McGregor after his wife. Uh, number 693 and 694. I know those numbers well. Where I sit here in the loft, 100 years ago, 105 years ago, those locomotives would have come through here hauling the mail trains to down to the border and down to Wollongarra and back to Brisbane as well. And uh, probably some of the guards who used to uh, put their stuff here in the loft would have walked out and gone for their trips um, behind the William McGregor and Lady McGregor. So, um, so yeah, so William McGregor, he certainly uh, loved the rail, Queensland Railways and did a lot of travelling. It was always, it's actually really, he had a real affection for us as well too, which is great to see. Okay, next one please there, Helen. I did mention about Vice Regals and things like that before William McGregor's. Uh, this is actually, I thought I'd slip this in. This is taken just over 100 years ago, July of 1920. Uh, the locomotive Sir William McGregor, and that was on the Royal Train and Vice Regal carriage. It was one of those carriages that uh, the Prince of Wales travelled in back in July of 1920. Um, when he came out here, he opened a railway line down to Amy Ons, down uh, out from uh, Cottonvale, Stanthorpe Way. He travelled. Um, uh, he travelled up to Karoi in those areas in Gympie. Uh, on the Royal train came through Toowoomba and that here, and that's the engine I mentioned before, Sir William McGregor, and that was it done up for a Royal train. They used to drive, do the engines up beautifully for the opening of uh, lines as well too, but not quite to that extent. I'm sorry to say for Kilcoy anyway. So yeah. Okay, Helen, on to the next one. That's great. Well, this is the opening. That's it gives you more an idea of what an opening train did look like, as you can see there. And uh, but the stations that were built there were lovely. They had this lovely Federation pagoda design, but they actually called them pagodas because of the pitch in the roof. They had um, ventilators in the roof, you know, to draw the warm air out and kind of cool it as well, natural ventilation. Um, and you can actually see there, well, you know, the locomotive there, how much had been done up for the special occasion. Um, they were carried, you know, the British and Australian flags and that, lots of flower garlands and that over it. And uh, I always love the fact that they had the flags, you know, up there from the cab of the locomotive through to what we call the steam dome and the sand domes and things like that on the locomotive as well. Um, I always have a bit of a chuckle in that because in this day of occupational workplace health and safety, they saw like their eyeballs tend to open a lot and uh, their eyebrows go up and they see photographs like that. And I said, oh, well, I said it was a different era. They did exercise a bit more common sense. And I said they did lavish a lot of attention, you know, on the official trains and that to make them look for the best occasions as well too, because it was a statement of pride and it was a celebration for the local community as well. Okay, Helen. So the openings, the openings were always so well reported in the press. Just about every word that was said at the opening ceremony was duly reported verbatim. There was always in brackets, applause, hear, hear, hearty cheers, you know, eye eyes and things like that to uh, get the audience reaction. And the speeches they gave were generally tend to be about, you know, the railway being constructed, the original settlers in the area, what the railway would mean to people and everything like that. And uh, basically about, you know, why the railway is constructed. And as you can see there, it was basically that the best steps were being uh, both taken to basically get people onto the land, to allow people who are on the land to get their produce to market and everything like that. And uh, basically uh, it was also that um, it was to tap the infinite natural resources of the state it was a scene back then. And it was entirely that lines were developmental. Um, they were basically there to provide a permanent way to provide a way for people to get their produce to market, to ensure that they weren't left isolated or anything like that. And more importantly, it also allowed people reliability to bring things to their lives and to take things away as well. So uh, yeah, so the official openings, uh, especially when the governor was there, uh, having the governor there was basically it was um, it was yeah it was a headline occasion for the community, and so it was also an opportunity to show off you know the you know the progress of the district, the possibilities of the district, and basically by having the railway there now you know the benefits that would come to um you know basically they'd come to it, and also of course it also meant votes for the local representatives as well in the parliament of course as you'd appreciate. So yeah, next one please Helen. There you go. So yeah. There you go. Well. So what was it like? Well, as I said, unfortunately the line closed um, back in uh, 64. That was long before I was born, so please don't blame me for the closure of the railway line or anything like that. Um, that, was, that was long before I appeared on this earth. But um, if you travelled on the line back then, well, what would have been like? So let's go back 110 years ago now. So what would have happened? You would have travelled down the line uh, or what was called a mixed train. And a mixed train was um, very common in the Queensland Railways from the 1860s up until the 1990s. 
and the mixed train was uh, that that carried everything. It carried passengers, generally in um, a guards van um, with accommodation, maybe an extra carriage or something like that for uh, people travelling on it. But it carried everything. It carried pigs. It would have carried potatoes. It would have carried um, the, it carried everything, basically sheep, cattle, car, horses, anything local produce went by a mixed train. So Queensland actually, we, we ran lots of these mixed trains throughout Queensland. Uh, in other parts of the uh, state, you might see three trains a week on the timetable, a mixed train, because they just take all the produce and people as well too. So your journey, you left Brisbane about 7.05 a.m. in the morning. You got out to Caboolture about two hours and five minutes later, 9.10, and then you got into Woodford at 10.45 in the morning. And uh, to get back to Brisbane, you would have caught the 1.30 train that arrived back at um, uh, at Brisbane at 5.23 p.m. So it was a it was a bit of a day of travel and everything like that. Of course, for people, it didn't matter about how long it took. The fact was they could actually buy a ticket, get on a train and uh, travel down to Brisbane and that and generally get down and back in the day, which is important, especially if you're doing any business or anything like that. So I found this wonderful quote. This was actually from um, a, well, a fellow from the Railway Historical Society who documented it. And he actually in 1943 he was in the Australian Army and he actually travelled down from Caboolture in 1943 to um, Kilcoy. So he was on leave at that stage. And I always love what he wrote about that line back in 1943, the journey. He said, look, it seems incredible that such a prehistoric place with its Rip Van Winkle locals is only 30 miles from Brisbane. And that's basically talking about Caboolture. He said the little engine, 535 seemed to get a little impatient and tore into it. The trip involves stopping for um, a passenger near a pineapple plantation. One of the more memorable moments was for four passengers who had tickets for Diagula, who were warned of the proximity of their stop by the guard looking in from the window on the outside. So literally the guard had got out from the guard and walked along the um, footboard on the side of the carriage, walked along, stuck his head in and just uh, let the passengers know, you know, that basically that um, they're getting close to Di Di Diagula station. And the passengers seen there seen the guard looking out there. It was a common Queensland practice. They used to walk along the footboards and things like that, the guard and that, looking in the carriages, checking tickets as they went. Um, one old time guard told me, Greg, I can assure you, you would not have worried about dying and dropping off the train traveling at high speed in those days. I can assure you of that anyway. So yeah. Anyway, so next one, please, Helen. So there are older residents, however, remember not only the mixed train or the steam trains as they call them. In many Queensland country communities, there was always a big difference between the steam train and the rail motor. And uh, for many years, these two, the steam train was the mixed train, it took many, uh, it took a good number of hours to do the run. Um, if you would travel from Bundaberg to Mount Perry when that line was open, you went on the steam train. The steam train took eight hours to do the 64 miles, basically, from Bundaberg out to uh, Mount Perry. If you went on the rail motor, it was a much quicker, quicker journey. The rail motor that you can see there, there are many of these, the Red Fences, they call them, running around Queensland on all the branch lines and things like that. They provided a daily service. Um, they used to carry mail, carry passengers, school kids, everything like that. Um, they ran at um, they ran much fa faster the rate of um, speeds and timetables than the uh, mixed trains, solely because of the fact that it was for passengers only. They didn't have to worry about shunting at various locations and things like that. But uh, these were the uh, famous rail motors or the uh, tin hairs or the Red Freds and that. and um, the first of these were actually introduced in 1927. They were self-propelled rail cars, and they actually they provided a fairly fast but a very bumpy ride on the branch lines. Um, in earlier years, they didn't actually didn't have pull-up windows of that. They were just canvas blinds dropped down. And as I've spoken to people who travelled on those in times past up here, and some of the engine drivers, and they said there was nothing more basically reminding you of. Uh, so as one put it one time. There was nothing more that reminded you exactly of um, uh, what purgatory could be like than travelling across the downs in a very cold June or July morning in one of these rail motors with the wind whipping along and the canvas blinds blowing and everyone rugged up basically. And he said um, when they bought him uh, so windows, it was almost seen as some wonderful comfort and things like that. But these rail motors were everywhere in Queensland. Dover had its own rail motor. Um, as I said, places like Kuya, uh, Crow's Nest, um, so many places had the rail motor that was actually based at the end of the line, in this case in Kilcoy. They also had their own driver. And uh, so in the early days, the rail motor uh, used to go down from, uh, ran from Caboolture to Kilcoy. It used to take two hours and 20 minutes. And then the service used to connect at uh, Caboolture with other trains on the North Coast line. It could be uh, a mail train, other passenger trains and things like that. So it acted as a feeder. Um, 
the other wonderful thing about these rail motors and the drivers and that and the thing I always loved about them was basically the fact that they provide such a local service to the community. Uh, here in Toowoomba, when the Kuya motors used to go out as they said and come back from lo locations and that, the driver would actually come in from, he'd actually have shopping lists for people. And they come off, people would give them money, stop along the way, they'd give the driver a shopping list of stuff they wanted in town, be it Toowoomba, even Brisbane and places like that. They'd go out because um, uh, they'd have so many hours off, you know, wherever it was, in this case central or wherever. So they actually they go off and the wonderful thing was basically they go off and do the shopping for people and then they bring it back. They'd stop off on the way and bring the shopping back. And guess what? Well, the money that they gave, the change was always given. It was always correct and everything like that. So the rail motor driver who used to live in town as well. He was actually the, um, you know, he sort of like had a bit of an exalted position in that. The other thing was the rail motor drivers, they held themselves apart from the ordinary steam train drivers as well too. Those sort of like considered themselves a little bit of an elite and things like that as well. So uh, yeah, so it was very much a local community service. And uh, as I said, it's been, I think it speaks volumes, the fact you give your money, you give the shopping list and everything be correct when you got back here and at the end of the day and everything like that. Okay. Next one please, Helen. Well, in the 1950s, if you decide to travel on the rail motor, you'd least to leave at uh, 7.40 in the morning and you'd be down in Brisbane in three hours later. Um, does seem like a bit of a time, but I guess you know, sometimes when you think about uh, traffic problems down in Brisbane, that area these days, three hours sometimes mightn't seem too obscene or something like that. But it was actually a three hour journey down. That's a bit similar to the rail motor used coming from Dabra down to Central as well. And uh, they, there was a bit of a little bit of an indignity, however, because in certain occasions, uh, they also substituted the steam train. So they put two or three carriages on in the steam locomotive and uh, they'd substitute that at times when the rail motor might have broken down or was out of service, or um, also sometimes when passenger numbers had increased, um, school holidays, you know, those sorts. That would also mean that uh, they have to put on um, a steam train uh, with carriages and things like that to replace the rail motor. And uh, actually, uh, when the line closed uh, to Kilcoy in June 1964, uh, it was actually rail motor 1948 that actually worked the last rail, rail passenger service as well. Now that line had continued, um, you know, with the with the rail motor and the uh, other services and that provided there. There were special trains that be run out there, you know, for um, uh, for livestock, cattle, and things like that. The mixed trains and goods trains used to run out on the line, and it continued that service for about 50 years and for about half a century. The trouble with a lot of these lines that were built in that period, from about say 1910 through especially to 1930. They're very susceptible to the arrival of the internal combustion engine, and especially as uh, car, car cars were introduced, as farmers got their own trucks and that. After the First World War, there were more vehicles available, but especially after the Second World War, because a lot of farmers and that, they couldn't trust the Queensland Railway employees because quite often things would disappear on the way down on the train or down when they got down to the markets in Roma Street. The railway archives and other archives are full of lots of stories about that of things disappearing on the trains, you know, and um, you know disappearing as well. So for a lot of farmers and things like that, but you know, a couple of hours to get your stuff to market and that, especially after the Second World War, for relatively cheaply, you can pick up a second-hand blitz wagon, you can pick up a second-hand vehicle, or, you know, ex-army vehicle or something like that. It was a lot easier for you to, to run on your own roads and do your transport rather than waiting for timetable trains and things like that. So the Second World War especially, it was the rise of the private motor car, the ability of people to have their own transport and that, that really ate into the, um, that ate into the railway service and to the economies of the railway as well. Now the thing that actually really brought about the end of the line was actually the raising of the, it was when they uh, built, um, um, it was basically when they raised Somerset Dam and um, it was the rising of the waters. It actually was the thing that eventually led to the decision to close, close the line. And as the water backed up from the uh, from Stanley River and that from the Somerset Dam, it was actually around bridge number 21. And there's quite a few photographs. I might have, I'm fairly sure I've got some here as we go. But it actually shows in around 1964, it does show the waters coming up progressively. And you can actually see when the train operate out to kill in those areas, bridge number 21, the Stanley River, and you could see the water coming up. And that was actually the decision that actually that was used to justify the closure of the line when it was going to happen. So the cost of the branch line above the rising waters, the relocation and um, basically deviation building new bridges, it was deemed un economic, and so what's led to the con decision to close the line beyond uh, where you're in in June of 1964. So next one, please, Helen. There you go. Well, as I said, we were talking about Kilcoy and uh, the railway lines. Well, this is what Kilcoy station looked like in around the early 1960s. 
The large thing that you can see there is the water tower or the uh, locomotive water tank. Um, old currency, that'd be within about 30,000 gallons of water in there. Steam locomotive there waiting to take a drink of water. Um, station there as well too. You've got the rolling stock there. And uh, that was actually the Kilcoy station in the early 1960s. So not exactly a great hive of activity. Would have been a hive of activity when the train came in and of course when the train left, of course. But it was very much like so many of our country lines in Queensland that had their own railway, had their own station, the station master, the porters and everyone that went with it. And further down the line, the smaller stations, be they, um, um, you know, between Woodford and Kil uh, uh, Kilcoy, those smaller stations always had a station mistress in charge. And uh, quite often she might be married to a ganger or something like that on that section as well. So there's a fair amount of employment and station mistresses looked after a lot of the smaller stations as well. So again, small stations, you would have had someone there to look after it and uh, to take all the, uh, you know, basically to do all the loadings and things like that, sell the tickets to the passengers and uh, uh, basically to provide that service. The next one, please, Helen. This is a bit more modern. Uh, those of you might remember the, um, uh, those of you who like your cars, I'm sure you would like to take that car for your own collection as well. To your right is one of the famous silver bullets of the Queensland Railways, the 2000 class rail motors. Uh, they were introduced initially in the mid 1950s, the stainless steel ones, and more came into service in the 1960s. And a lot of those actually replaced a lot of the old uh, Rattlers and Red Freds over times on various um, uh, runs here on the Queensland Railways. So they were the diesel, that's uh, one of them there. Um, the original ones I think were Rolls-Royce engine powered, and they were what they call the silver bullets. We've still got a few of those running around today. Savannah Lander in North Queensland, Mary Valley operates some um, 2000 class motors as well. And uh, they were very good things. Um, used to get up to about 100 kilometres an hour, quite, quite happily get up to 60 miles an hour as well. So um, they were um, are actually very popular in a lot of the country runs. And places like Kilcoyne, they've benefited a lot from being close to Brisbane because they got the benefit of what was then a fairly modern rail motor service, as you can see. Uh, next one, please, Helen. Again. And again, Kilcoy Station. Uh, steam locomotive there doing some shunning as well. And as you can see, now see that fellow there walking along with the uh, satchel and dressed in his motorcycle leathers. The fellow who took the photograph was um, a gentleman by the name of Eric Margraff. And sadly, Eric passed away. He was close to 90 earlier this year. He literally traveled thousands of miles in Southern Queensland in the 1960s, photographing a lot of these railways. And you know, before they disappeared, um, the rolling stock, the locomotives, um, the buildings, the landscape, the lines. And it was enthusiasts like uh, Eric Margraff and that the Railway Historical Society, if they hadn't been out documenting this, we wouldn't have this now. Um, the railways themselves were a bit loath, you know, to document this because, you know, they're seen as a modernization phase and that. But a lot of the enthusiasts did, thankfully. And you've got these wonderful photographs that show, you know, this wonderful slice of country life in the 1960s and, you know, mid 20th century Queensland with the railway being part of the landscape. Um, it's Eric Margraff's brother actually, um, I told me, dressed in his leathers. They used to ride around on their motorcycles and that dressed like that, that basically for, uh, doing photographing of uh, steam trains and things like that. Sometimes riding their motorcycles and occasionally driving the locomotives, as they told me. It was a different era back then. And generally talking to the railway employee who, um, as you can see, the typical railway employee there with the uh, vest and the uh, uh, wool trousers with the hat on. And it could have been a guard shunner or uh, someone like that, obviously uh, going out to um, after train had got into the uh, terminus or into the station there to do a shunting and everything like that. Next one, please, Helen. Kilcoy, there's your station down the end of the street. The Kilcoy station with that lovely pagoda design. Um, steam train, that, as I said, the uh, train that just arrived there. Um, Kilcoy was interesting because it was built to a heavier standard than a normal than the other branch lines in Queensland. So they could actually take what we in the railway called uh, mainline locomotives. And mainline locomotives were exactly that. They could operate um, on lines, um, say, Brisbane to Toowoomba. So they could take heavier engines, bigger engines. So they could take bigger engines in the railways and the steam days. They could take things like a B18 and a quarter or something like that, a BB18 quarter. They were big engines, um, about 90 to 100 tonnes in that. Had heavier axle loads, so they could actually take engines off the main line to do these runs as well. So um, yeah, there are a number of lines that could do that, but uh, Kilcoy was, um, you know, regularly saw these locomotives. And that's just down the end of the street there, as you can see where the railway yards were. Okay, and the next one, please. There you go, so. One of the things that uh, Kilcoy had, quite a few others, that there, someone asked me about it one time, is a bridge that wasn't quite completed. I said, not at all, no, it's a timber stage. And that was used basically for transferring uh, uh, timber logs onto, um, 
onto wagons to be taken down to Brisbane or um, transferring a timber and that. And that was what you call the timber stage that was there. Um, it's quite a remarkable structure. But if you look at it closely, you can see it's very close to being like a trestle railway bridge that was built as well, similar designs. And you can actually see just off to the side there with the chains and that which they used to be able to pick up and uh, uh, with the log or timber and move it across. It would have been like a little um, electric powered motor or something like that above that as well, basically to so they could ship from um, the back of a truck or something like that onto a rail wagon uh, there beside the timber stage. Okay, and wait, any more there, Helen? I was like, yeah, let's see. That's it. Uh, that's it, we almost got to the end of the line there, so yeah. So yeah, so that was the story of the Kilcoy branch. Yeah, it was funny, it was the rising of the waters in a lot of ways that you know, saw the end of it. Um, and many lines in Queensland like that. It kept the line open as far as where you ran for two reasons. There was the um, uh, quarry that was back at Mood Lou. It was also pineapples. It was the pineapples actually from that area that um, kept the line open when you ran. I think it closed back in about 91 or 93, if memory serves me correct. And of course, you know, it's a walking trail, you know, it's a walking trail in this day and age. Um, but uh, yeah, it was pineapples that kept that line open. And a lot of these lines, as they developed, you know, they helped develop the dairy industry in Queensland. And um, there was a famous old saying in the railways that was pigs, potatoes, cream, cows, uh, what was it, calves, to, um, bananas, pineapples. And that's what kept a lot of these uh, railway lines going, you know, in the early, in the, um, you know, after they were built 1920s through the 1960s and things like that. The traces are still there today and it's remarkable, you know, I think uh, things like rail trails and things like that coming. One classic uh, interesting case is the railway line that ran out to, um, uh, from uh, out to Dabra, Terrace Creek. It opened back in 1920, back in September, and the line closed beyond Fernie Grove in 1955. It was an early casualty because of the growth of motorised transport out competing the railways and uh, basically making railway uneconomic. And when people talk about, oh, they should have kept the railway, you know, you saw like an agreement, but as I said, you've got to put your mind, we're talking about half a century ago, 60 years ago, and people saw the railways as being a dead thing. Basically, you know, want, you know freeways, cars and that were the way to go. But the other thing too is about the number of people that traveled on the trains. And quite often I, I say, the number of people that cycle along from where you ran and those areas now on the bike trails and things like that, probably on a weekend, you get more people traveling then than might have been traveling an entire month coming down from Kilcoy in those areas, you know, on the rail motors and things like that. But uh, what's remarkable, I think, is the fact that, you know, you still see the survivors of the railway around places and name boards and, you know, mango trees and locations. And that's always a good railway lamppost, as I say, to say where the stations were and everything like that. Anyway, so that's it. So Helen, I did say we'd do about an hour today and I think we're fairly close. So hopefully my timetable keeping has been going good and everything like that. Um, it's been quite exciting actually, you know, here in this part of the 21st century, talking about something that was built, you know, just over 100 years ago. It closed, you know, 50, 60 years ago now, well, 60 years ago now, uh, talking about that. And uh, yeah, I think it's been quite a pleasure today actually to be able to share it with you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Greg. That was a, that was really fascinating and I'm yeah, so glad you could join us today and thank you to the, our audience for tuning in, yep. both in person and online. Yeah. <laughs> Good and, uh, oh, well, I'll work on the theory now just to find a cup of tea for myself up here anyway. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. You definitely have. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.